All right, Revelation chapter 8. Turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 8. Your King James Bible. Say, ah, oh, he's King James only. Oh, yeah, and you're going to see why by the end of the study. Uh, there's some interesting things here I'm going to show you towards the end of the study. But uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. It says here, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now people might say, well, how could there be silence in heaven for a half hour? Because I thought there's no time there. Well, it doesn't say for a half hour. It says about the space of a half hour. All right. So John is just kind of guesstimating. It's probably actually a lot shorter than that. But, you know, when you're up there and all of a sudden God gets quiet, I think it'd be probably kind of an eerie feeling, and you'd probably feel like, well, this is really taking a long time just to just kind of stand there. You're kind of looking at each other like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, you see that later on in the book of Revelation where God's actually so angry that everybody's just kind of standing there just like, you know, <laughs> quiet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a joke about this verse here. They say, uh, you know, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I heard some guy say the one time he said, well, that proves that there's no women in heaven because no woman could be silent for a half hour. Ha, 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 you know. Of course, when you hear women, they respond back to that and they say, well, we're silent in heaven. We don't need to talk in heaven because we're finally in the presence of a man that doesn't make mistakes. So we don't have to say anything, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, the Christian men are conformed to his image. So, you know, there's nothing there for women to say, so they just, you know, they can finally be quiet. They don't have to correct the, their husbands or their brothers in Christ. Good points on both sides there, but uh, verse 2, Revelation chapter 8, verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay, now you'll see this all throughout the book of Revelation. Seven, 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 seven. Uh, very interesting. That's just a re, uh, theme that's repeated. And if you saw last week's or whenever the last study, Revelation chapter 7, I'm not sure if it's going to be a week in between you know, these studies. Probably. But if you saw the Revelation 7 one, I talked a little bit about the Bible system of numbers. And 7 is God's number. So, very interesting. Let's look at verse 3 and 4 here. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now right now the Catholics get all excited, and they're jumping up and down, they're saying, the prayers, the prayers, the incense and stuff, see, it's Catholicism. No, actually, you need to just read the scripture here. It says... He should offer it with the prayers of all saints. Not the prayers to saints, like Catholicism teaches. It's the prayers of the saints. You see it? Verse 4, with the prayers of the saints. So you have up in verse 3, prayers of all saints. Verse 4, prayers of the saints. Okay? Anybody who is saved is a saint. Every single Christian out there is a saint. You don't need to be canonized and eulogized and proselytized and, you know, uh, what's the fertilized or, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the thing that they do, mummification, you know, where they, they stick you in the, you know, uh, what's the stuff that they call it, formaldehyde, that's it, I'm trying to think of it, you know. Now you don't need that, like the embalming and things like this, like the ancient Egyptians did, which the Catholics now do, and, you know, interesting, I had a, uh, I forget who it was, sent me a one of you, I think, posted a link to this thing of this Padre Pio and the Pope Francis has called him his dead body to come to the Vatican. And so they're praying this dead corpse around in this glass container, you know. And uh, he's laying there, uh, you know, St. Stinky here. And, and you know, and, and he's laying there dead. And, uh, you know, and people coming up, you know, and putting their hands on the coffin, uh, you know, praying and stuff. And I'm going, yeah, okay, a little sick. And then some other rotten saint, you know, too, and they got him in a glass box, you know. It's kind of funny because when I was a boy, I used to take bugs, you know, and I'd put them in a glass jar or something like that. I'd collect bugs, you know. I guess I was becoming a Catholic. I don't know. Could have been named them saints or something. 
I think I've insulted the Catholics enough just for the next five seconds at least. But let's look at a scripture here on the thing of saints. What is a saint? Ephesians, keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 8. And we'll go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We'll see if there's a distinction between uh, saints, like some kind of a, you know, lowercase gods or something, lower uh, thing of gods or something that you offer your prayers to, or if they're just regular Christians. Let's look at this. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Who are you talking about? Special people that are in heaven, St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. You know, no. Christians, therefore followers of God as dear children. Verse 2, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for, an, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. See? We're all saints. I'm a saint. If you're a Bible-believing Christian that's born again, you're a saint. We are saints. Pretty good. And I have a whole study here. Um, it's called uh, How to Become a Saint According to the King James Version, the KJV. Uh, you can look that up. Again, go to my channel and look up, type in How to Become a Saint According to the KJV. There's a two-part study showing showing all the scriptures, all the arguments for the thing of Christians or saints. In Catholicism, they have this thing of God the Father, and then there's a whole plethora of lowercase g gods. Because, see, Roman Catholicism is just sanctified paganism. Paganism, they have all these, you know, you have, uh, what's the guy, Zeus, I guess, and on Mount Olympus, and then you have Mercury, and you have this guy, Hercules, and you know, he's a product of Zeus and some woman or something like this, and all these lowercase gods. See, and then the Catholics come along and they go, hmm, we can't, you know, do our uppercase, you know, our upper god and, you know, our Roman god and then all the lowercase gods. What can we do? Well, we'll just say, you know, God the Father and then we'll have Joseph. Then we'll have, you know, all these other saints, Thomas and St. Peter and St. 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 And, you know, you go and you got a toothache, you pray to this saint, and you, you know, have a trip that you're going on. And, you, and I'm being serious here. This is what they do. And that you are going to go on a trip, you want safe travel mercies, you pray to this saint. You don't pray to God. One mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Oh, no, you don't do that. You don't pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. you got to go through a saint. That's not what's going on in Revelation chapter 8. Okay, It's the prayers of the saints, not the prayers to the saints. Very important to remember that. Verse 5, Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. You can go back there. Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Ooh, very, very interesting. Um, I don't know if you keep up with some of this stuff that goes on, um, but there's these weird sounds that are being heard all over the world and these weird trumpet type sounds and things. There's a lot of videos on YouTube, you know, where they're playing these sounds and people are like, okay, what's this all about? And news media and things, you know, local news media, their people are like, yeah, we heard this like massive explosion and it like shook the house and you know, whatever. And they're just going like, okay, what is this? It wasn't an earthquake. It wasn't this, it wasn't that. And there's, this is increasing. Okay, and there are earthquakes are definitely increasing, just like Jesus said they would in Matthew chapter 24. So it's pretty wild stuff. You know, I had somebody actually contact me the one time. They said, what do you think about this whole thing of these trumpets? These, you know, you hear this like, and it's not a freight train, you know, down in the valley either. It's this weird thing coming from above. And I was kind of like, yeah, you know, they sent me links to some of the videos and I'm going, eh, yeah, you know, and one was like, you know, they were local news media was reporting on this. And I'm like, well, that kind of has a little bit of validity to it because local news media is going to be skeptical about stuff like that. They wouldn't really report this. 
and they were reporting eyewitnesses and people were like, yeah, I heard this thing is really weird. So uh, this is when we were still down in Pennsylvania, my wife and I. So this one place where we were living in northern, northwestern PA, we're laying there in bed the one morning. I've told this story before, but I'm just repeating it if you haven't heard it. And we're laying there in bed the one morning and all of a sudden it's just like clear as day. I hear this like, almost like a chauffeur or shofar, you know, the, the ram's horn that the Jews blow, loud. And I'm like, eyes open, you know, we're both like, whoop, wide awake. And we're like, I said, did you hear that? She's like, I heard that. And I'm like, and we, about that time, again, and I'm going. And so I, I jump up and I run and I'm grab, I grab a camera and I got out the front steps onto the porch and I push record and I'm like, okay, do it again, do it again. <laughs> Didn't do it again. So I heard it. My wife and I both heard it. Uh, you say, what was it? I have no idea. I have no idea. It was unlike anything I've ever heard before. Um, could it have been this right here in Revelation chapter 8, verse uh, 5? There were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Is that what people are starting to hear? There's some major conversation going on up in heaven, and people down on the earth are starting to go, Did you hear that? You know, I heard something. Mm -hmm. And it's going to increase, and it's going to be in full uh, production, if you will, in the time of Jacob's trouble. People are going to be hearing conversations in heaven in the form of thunder. Again, you can do the study on that. Lost people, when they hear God's voice, they say it thundered. Hmm. Very interesting. Let's read verses 6 through 12. Again, you're not, you know, there's not a whole lot of stuff in this. Uh, that can I can apply doctrinally, you know, or instruction and righteousness to us today. But uh, verses 6 through 12, we'll read these. And notice a re reoccurring theme here, okay? Notice the acronym, or the uh, thing there for three, a third. Watch this. Revelation 8, verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the stars called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Interesting. There's a lot of thirds in there. What's going on? Well, the Lord remembers things, certain things. He doesn't forget. He's in eternity. He can see everything from eternity past to eternity future. All right, we're stuck in time. We, we are just here and we don't, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But God does. And you see, the Lord can remember what was done to His Son. And uh, there are some people that uh, he has some dealings, some things that he's going to, you know, kind of work out. Let's turn, keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 8, and we'll turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter two, verse seven through eight. It says here, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Hmm. 
So I can read. Okay, those two verses. Who did they crucify on the cross? Jesus. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There goes the soul. And he gave up the what? Ghost. Jesus was the part of the Godhead that died on the cross. The soul goes up, God the Father. The Spirit is the Holy Ghost. He leaves. And Jesus takes the sin of the world upon himself, upon the flesh, the body of the Godhead. And again, you know, great is the mystery of godliness. I can't explain all this stuff and, and everything else. I believe it because the Bible said so. Okay? But you see, God has a controversy with man. He sent his son to die for people's sins. And the people reject him. So the Lord says, okay, you've rejected me and rejected me and rejected me and rejected me all those centuries, all those years. And now I'm going to do things to pay back. It's payback time. That's why he destroys a third of this and a third of that and a third of that because man in his wickedness and sin killed a third of the Godhead. They murdered the Lord of glory. Yeah. Had they known it, had they known who he really was, and I mean he showed them enough proof that they could have known, but had they known it, they wouldn't have killed him. And I'm going to tell you right now, in that time of Jacob's trouble, there's going to be people saying, Boy, I sure wish they wouldn't have killed Jesus back then. Because, boy, are we suffering right now. You see, people in the time of Jacob's trouble, every single one of them deserves to be there. There's not going to be one innocent person in the time of Jacob's trouble. Everybody that misses the rapture is because they rejected Jesus Christ. The third part of the Trinity, the Godhead. So the Lord's going to pay them back. You say, well, God wouldn't be so vengeful. But you don't know the Lord too good, do you? He remembers what happened. And He takes it out on the earth and on the people on this earth. And He shows them plainly, you killed my son, I'm going to kill a third part of everything you have. And you know, I mean, you read down through that list there and, and think about the significance of this. You know? Think about a third part of the trees being gone, all green grass burned up. Think of the smoke that's going to be created from that. Incredible. And not just a local fire someplace that people go, wow, that was really bad. Worldwide. Yeah. Then throw all the other judgments in with it. Absolutely incredible. Verse 13. Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Woe, woe, woe. Three angels. Interesting. But uh, who is it that flies through the midst of heaven? That would be an angel. Uh, actually, though, you see... This King James Bible, it's, it, it's so archaic. I mean, who can understand what an angel is? You know, archaic. Why don't we update it? Let's start out with Young's literal translation. We have messenger. Isn't that nice? The messenger. It's a messenger flying. He's telling him stuff like this. I mean, that's a lot clearer than angel. Okay, that's the literal, you know, definite literal thing. No, it's a lot of these people, the Young and, and you know, a lot of these others these Greek scholars, what they do is they blend Alexandrian Greek with Texas Receptus type of Greek. Two totally different Bibles, completely different. And um, one used, the Alexandrian used by the Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox Church uses the Texas Receptus. Um, you know, that's a big issue, but we're not going to get into it. But, you know, I don't trust this Young's literal translation thing. I think it's hogwash. God's never used it. God doesn't bless it. But uh, next we have the message. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, instead of messenger or angel, it has lone eagle. So we have a talking, flying lone eagle. I mean, I've heard of terrorist attacks. They say, watch out for lone wolf terrorist attacks. But apparently this is going to be a lone eagle attack. Next we have the Amplified Bible. It says solitary eagle. 
Poole, the Common English Bible, An Eagle, the Contemporary English Version, Lone Eagle, the English Standard Version, all the most close to the best translation, and, yeah, the darling of the evangelicals, An Eagle. Much better scholarship than the King James Bible. I mean, these guys back then, I mean, they're just terrible scholars. You know, they have angel that talks. It's more accurate to say eagle, talking eagle. How about the Holman Christian, Christian Standard Bible? It says an eagle. New American Standard Bible, an eagle. New King James Version, an angel with a footnote that says, Revelation 8.13, the Nestle Aland, the Nestles or United Bible Society there, the NU text and majority text, the M there, read eagle. So you see, they put the right word in the text, but then they question it in the footnote. Satanic deception. The New King James Version is just another rotten new version. Don't use it. The New Revised Standard Version says an eagle. The NIV, an eagle. The Dewey Reams of 1899, one eagle. And by the way, it's the same thing in the 1582 Reams New Testament. So don't say, well, they, they changed it to read more like the King James Bible. Yeah, they did in the late 1800s because the original Reams Bible, the Dewey Reams, Dewey being the Old Testament, Reams being New Testament, they came out with the New Testament first, and then the Dewey Old Testament translation. Jesuits wrote the thing. I have it right there, over there. I've showed it in other videos. But um, there, it was so corrupt and so terrible that they had to make it sound more like the King James Bible in the 1800s. Um, can't think of the guy's name that did her Challoner, the Challoner Revision. But anyways, the New American Bible. Again, Roman Catholic Bible. This is probably the most popular of the Roman Catholic Bibles. The New American Bible says an eagle. And the Orthodox Jewish Bible says one nesher, in parentheses, eagle. I mean, it's just so terrible being a King James Bible-believing Christian. You know, we're stuck with this old archaic Bible. It says angel. It should be reading, more accurately reading in, a, in uh, eagle. Set of angel, eagle. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's going to be it for this study of Revelation chapter 8. You know, some of these chapters in Revelation, we're not going to be getting a whole lot of instruction in righteousness. Uh, there's some definite, you know, neat stuff there um, in this chapter, but a lot of it's just describing the events. We're going to be hitting a lot of that in the next couple of chapters. Um, but, you know, we're doing chapter by chapter, so I'm going to go through each one. I'm not going to skip a chapter. But uh, the, Re the book of Revelation is an amazing book, but we'll, you'll never really truly understand it as a Christian in the church age because things are going to be very different. I mean, I can say I could not have understood life today 10 years ago. If you'd have told me about the technology that's out today and the things that are on the... the main news and things of the day right now. If you told me about that 10 years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. I'd have been like, what? <laughs> you got to be crazy. You know, nah, that's not going to happen. But here we are. Some of the things that are going on today are just unbelievable. What's it going to be like when the body of Christ leaves and people are in the time of Jacob's trouble? You talk about crazy times. It's going to be insane. So that's why I've been praying about this study and just asking the Lord to show me things that I can show Christians today in the book of Revelation that will be challenges to challenge you to holier living and uh, to live in for the Lord and uh, serving Him with your life. That's the purpose of these studies. Uh, and I know a lot of people have said that they've really enjoyed this and I, th I thank the Lord for that. Um, I enjoy doing these studies. So I'm going to keep doing them as long as the Lord gives me the wisdom to be able to do this. And uh, definitely appreciate the input from the body of Christ. So that is going to be it for this study. And we will see you in the next video.